see everything works before we start the recording. Uh, yeah. Right. Are, are you ready, Celine? Um, I'm knowing there is some this thing that usually disappears, but no. All right. Do you see? Um, yeah, I see the the whole slide, so it's fine with me. Okay, let me do that. Okay. All right. May May I ask before I start? Um, just if I can have a feeling because um, <laughs> I see the number of students redu reducing. Is it uh, really hard to follow? Do you want me to go slower or give more details? Or if I maybe just put it in the chat, maybe we can have a look. Again, I'm blind, so... Yeah, okay, maybe. so... Um, yes. Please, participant, let us know if you should go with more detail or more slow or the pace is fine. Maybe I can have a look at... Uh, I stop. Um, so... Max say uh, it's all good. <laughs> Dario as well. Okay, all are positive comments. So I think you can just keep on the same line. Okay, great. Thank uh, well, you there's, a, there's a question about more references. Oh, okay. okay Maybe great. if you don't have them today, you could prepare them for tomorrow. Yeah, I, can add, I can add some. And also I promise a nuclear synthesis that I'll do it tomorrow because I'm a bit rushed now. So I'll try to get as much as I can today so that tomorrow can be just wrapping up and showing you the whole story. And then I'll answer the nuclear synthesis. Um, so I can start now, is that okay? Uh, yes, please. So we're very happy to have Celine who will deliver the fourth lecture. So please go ahead. Thank you. All right, so this is the fourth lecture, but um, I'm going just to finish um, the third lecture, which was on particle candidate. This is just to remind you, so we were talking about the early density yesterday and the candidates. One thing at some stage, I think there was some confusion because this graph is showing the number of particles, not the number density. And uh, just in the middle part, what I was showing you really in, in this graph has to be the number. So I should be the um, exponential times the AQ, which I didn't write yesterday, which might be why some, some of you were confused. So I, hopefully you understood that um, you have a number of processes through the evolution of the universe, the, part, the dark matter particles annihilate, and eventually uh, you have a number today. So we use that to get the, um, uh, the cross section. And I show you that uh, in the 70s, um, people were actually deducing that dark matter had to be heavy. And then um, 25 years later, the whole picture changed and we started to propose light dark matter, but then we also started to move from a more um, model approach instead of theory. So at some stage, a lot of people introduced new mediators, which we call the dark sector. And um, in this case, obviously it changes everything because uh, oh, sorry. in this case, basically you pass from uh, initial uh, assumptions, which were the dark matter annihilates and it annihilates into some number of particles. It annihilates because of the same number density of dark matter, the same, I mean, the dark matter has the same number density as anti dark matter particles. Um, and then we moved to a state where we started to think, well, actually, we could, we could think about an asymmetry between the number density. We could think about new mediators. We could think about a different type of annihilation and so on. But it was still conventional. And in the last decade, uh, really people have uh, questioned absolutely everything. And so now there is no need to have to impose that the dark matter and anti-dark matter be the same, number density be the same. Um, we could also imagine that the dark matter totally disappeared and a process made it reappear. So that's called regeneration. Um, we could also imagine that there are many dark matter candidates, but if there are many dark matter candidates, the early density has to be split in between the different species. And so the question is, how do you do this? I mean, this has to be arbitrary because you don't, you don't measure it. So um, because of this, because it has to be arbitrary, you lose the prediction. And um, we also know now that dark matter doesn't have to be thermal. 
So this is an important point that we'll, uh, I will speak about today. Um, and we also now start to say, well, maybe it doesn't annihilate at all. Or if it annihilates, maybe it annihilates into sector which is invisible to us. So really the last decade or 20 years, basically, have been a complete revision of our knowledge. And that on this land, because we don't see the dark matter. So the moment we will see an uh, evidence for dark matter, this would, this would change, um, you know, this would tell us which road we need to take. Um, for now, every, everything is open and everyone is exploring every single route possible, as it should be, really. So, uh, so far I was talking about thermal dark matter and I will continue a tiny bit, but I want to show you exceptions to the idea of computing the relic density using the freeze out. So I mentioned a few seconds ago the regeneration mechanism. But there is also something else called the freezing mechanism. And in the freezing mechanism, uh, which is also an old idea, in fact, but in the freezing mechanism, the idea is dark matter has very weak interaction, so weak that, in fact, they never really thermalize. So in the early universe, they're not thermal in a sense. But eventually, uh, or they're there, but they have, I mean, they would be thermal potentially, but they don't have any interaction which are uh, important enough to actually um, uh, stay and follow the normal thermal uh, relic density. But then eventually, because the universe cools down and the, density, um, the densities basically decrease, there is a moment where somehow it comes in equilibrium. And that's the moment where it essentially it can start annihilate and the number density can decrease. So this freezing mechanism is really a late entry to the, um, um, so it's freezing because it's coming in, if you want. Uh, it's coming in the thermal uh, regime. And then eventually you can compute the annihilation cross section and you can compute essentially the number density that you're uh, left with at the end of this mechanism. Uh, this is a mechanism which is used for any particles which has very weak interactions. I, I see that Julian has a question. Yes, please Julian, uh, go ahead. Uh, yes, hello. Um, so I was wondering, um, like, what are actually the limits of um, like dark matter not really interacting or, at all? So neither have a fr freeze out nor a freeze in. So just like it has this abundance and it stays there like for the whole universe. Like, yeah. yeah, that can happen too. Uh, but then you cannot do anything about that. I mean, this is the worst scenario because if nature has, for whatever reason, has chosen this, then we can't really tell anything because it would have been produced in the right number. I mean, the right value. And then we can't really prove it, basically. So that's why people don't really discuss it. But that's a possibility. Though I really hope that's, that's not realized in nature. But yeah. Um, all right. So, sorry, what is that problem? The other thing people have proposed was um, what they call cannibal dark matter, which is basically instead of having two dark matter give something else, nice three dark matter can give two dark matter. And by doing this, and then eventually they annihilate, but by doing this, they read the dark matter candidate. So that allows you to basically get a bit, of, I mean, to change um, the results, the usual results from thermal uh, dark matter. So it can be a thermal dark matter candidate and yet doesn't behave like a thermal dark matter candidate from the point of view of the relic density calculation. So I, I don't want to spend too much time. I just wanted to raise your attention to the fact that um, people are becoming more and more uh, innovative and creative, but there are plenty of exceptions. Essentially. Now the non-thermal candidates. Uh, so what if the dark matter was, non was not produced thermally uh, in the early universe? And one of those cases would be, for example, what we call sterile neutrinos. So a, ne a neutrino which um, is not exactly the active neutrino and then mix with uh, the active neutrino. Uh, in this case, it's a valid candidate, but you have to, I mean, obviously you have to compute the relic density again. Um, and those candidates, they don't necessarily annihilate, they tend to decay. So you have to compute the decay rate. Uh, the expression is written here. It's not that interesting in terms of uh, showing, I mean, see, showing you the expression, but Typically, the mass range, what I wanted to draw your attention is the mass range is around a few keV. And that is interesting, and I will explain probably tomorrow the details, but that is interesting because I mentioned the free streaming before. Those particles will experience the free streaming, but it's not like for active neutrino. It's enough 
to form structures. So it's just a limit where you can actually form all the structure which have been observed. So those candidates are actually quite attractive in the sense that uh, they may in fact solve some problems that, uh, that we see in cosmology. Um, and obviously they're related to the neutrinos. So it's quite appealing in that sense that it's a new sector, but it's a new sector which you cannot expect because you know that neutrinos have mass and, and you need to explain why they do. Um, now, a few years ago, uh, there was a lot of um, interest for those particles. And that is because at some stage people realized that there was a line, 3.5 keV, uh, which could be produced by a 7 keV uh, sterile neutrino. And so the first paper was by Kev Abazijan, uh, sorry, Abazijan. Um, but then there was a lot of controversy. And in fact, there was uh, some people, um, notably Stefano Profumo and, and Tesla Jetlema, who realized that well, 3.5 keV is potassium, basically. So um, you can have just a pollution in some objects that can just be the line of potassium. And that can be um, basically a, um, a systematic effect in, in the observation, I mean, in your uh, measurement. Now, that was quite funny because uh, that's why they said um, the discovery of the 3.5 keV line in the galactic center had a critical look at the origin of line across astronomical targets. They had another paper after where they say it's basically going uh, bananas in reference to the fact that potassium is in bananas. But essentially, um, there was a lot of paper looking at that and saying, no, it's probably not due to dark matter. So um, uh, to be honest, I don't know where we are with this, but I don't think people um, believe it's um, there's a strong evidence for serial neutrino. I think a lot of people think that the signal probably is more related to astrophysics now. Um, but it's to show you that um, in principle, dark matter can also be in that range and you can have some interesting signature. Sorry, I see the Chivam as a question. Yes, please Chivam, go ahead. Yeah, so I had this question in, in the previous slide. Uh, in the previous yes. slide, yes, here. Yeah, the, the, there are processes like three to two and two to three. So these processes will be mass suppressed. So uh, what kind of coupling, uh, the order of coupling that would be required for these these kind of processes to actually contribute in the uh, relic density abundance calculation? Yeah, so you, uh, I'm afraid you would have to go back to the paper. So I put the reference. Um, I mean, this was a new version with um, at the bottom of the screen, you can see. Um, but uh, if you have two strong couplings, I mean, two large couplings, you you can see you have uh, efficient annihilation, so you're going to read the dark matter a lot. So um, in principle, you can do that, but you shouldn't do it at a moment where you have critical observations. So it depends on the dark matter mass. So if the dark matter is fairly heavy, in principle, you, you can do it fairly early. I mean, you can have large couplings and that should be fine. If your dark matter is light, then you have to be very careful because you read the dark matter and you have, sorry. <coughs> you have consequence, um, notably you modify the free streaming length and so on. So you be, you need to be very careful. Sorry, excuse me. Okay, yeah, thank you. And then we have another question by Max. Oh, okay. Hi. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. So, since we, we already came back here, I wanted to ask. So, I have the question about the free freeze in the mechanism. So, uh, can you maybe give some in intuition about how? how so, how can, can so how so what are the properties of these particles that for for high temperature they they have a low interaction rate? But for low temperature, it gets high because I don't, I cannot think of of, of a, a, a scenario why this should make sense. Such a thing. Um, sorry, maybe I mis I mis uh, mis explain this. Um, you start with particles which have a number density which is what it is, but it's too low for being interesting. However, uh, so maybe I, sorry, I'm going to explain it differently. Um, it's a number density, okay? So it's a number per volume. At a given time, you have a certain volume. The volume is small in the early universe. So if the number density um, is very, very tiny, uh, you have a compensation between N and B and the volume. If the number density is very large, then the number density is obviously large, okay? So as the volume decreases, 
uh, then the number density in principle decreases. But what's going on is that all the, the other particles decouple. So you have a reheating through, I mean, if you want to change the number of uh, all the particles decouple, by that I mean they annihilate, they produce photons. So you have little bumps um, in the temperature of the universe because the particle eventually finishes photons, some of the particles which decay. Um, do you, you follow me or no? Uh, yes, I think I understand what you're saying, but, but I don't understand why, how this answers my question. Um, so, so, if I so if I understood your question, it's why do they freeze in, right? Why do they come back to the uh, thermal spectrum? Is it what you're saying? Or yes, and, 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 and in particular because you wrote that so such a thing could happen if the particle, so if the, if the, if the rate of the particle the interaction rate is, is, is anti-proportional to the temperature. So, so if this is the case, then I, I, I can understand why, why this freeze in could, could, could take place. But I, but, but I can, cannot even imagine why this rate should, should make sense. So why, how could the particle have this rate which is anti-proportional to the temperature? Um, yeah, so I propose a, I found a way to explain that tomorrow because I'd like to move on. I can put more details tomorrow and I can show you tomorrow in detail okay. because I think I need to show you the equations and I don't have them uh, with me right now. Is that okay? I thought maybe there was some easy intuition, but okay, yes, of course. Then. Uh, it's just the right, uh, the interaction, right? It's just the way you have to write the interaction, right? Yeah. And given that you have, so the interaction, right, is uh, usually sigma Vn, but here you don't, the sigma V is not necessarily the annihilation. So you have also the, the scattering. And what you have to account is also, um, so you have two number density in principle when I write the Boltzmann equation, which is a number density for dark matter and the other species. That's what maintain them in contact. Uh, now you have, when you use a Boltzmann equation, that's why I wanted to write a slide for that because when you write the Boltzmann equation, you see that you get rid of a dark matter um, dark matter density and you're left with the other one. So they still, they still maintain in contact. It's just because the other one is decreasing and sometimes disappearing. Okay. Uh, I think it's easier if I show you a slide for detail. Okay. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, yeah, so another example of uh, non-thermal dark matter is the following, uh, is, sorry, is the action. And the axiom, so again, I think I have to rush today. So I, um, I can't really give you many details, but I think you have lectures anyway on this topic. Um, but axioms basically are the typical, I mean, are related to QCD. So you have a QCD Lagrangian. Can I just ask, uh, there was lecture on axiom already, right? Or is something? Um, no, there wasn't yet. Okay. Um, maybe Stefania Gori will cover it. Okay, I'm not so, sure. okay, so I, I have two, three slides, so then I, I take time for, for that. Thanks. Uh, so you have a QCD uh, Lagrangian, which is written here, in which you have a part which describes the uh, gluons, another part which describes the quarks, and then you have this interaction, the last term. So the last term, in principle, can give rise um, to, um, to, um, to a CP violating term. And um, this is controlled by a phase which is called theta. So the question is, is, I mean, theta can be here, can be in this term, but in practice, we don't feel it. So it must be small. And the question is, why is it small? And in fact, why is it potentially zero, since it could be here? So um, the way to explain this is that um, if you have, and I took, shamelessly I took this from a, a postdoc in my group, uh, Kieran, who is an expert. But uh, typically, if you, have a, if you have your potential and you have um, if you have a particle, an axiom field, let's say, which uh, particle is rolling down the potential, um, it, um, this will basically generate a tilt in the potential, which uh, can help you mitigate the apparition of this uh, violating term. And so you have a tilt, which is there to compensate the violating term, to cancel it, basically. So in order to kill the, the last term in the Lagrangian, you, um, you have a certain value for the tilt, which is noted here as initial tilt theta. So the analogy I can give you, which is uh, an analogy PRCTV gave a long time ago, but I think it's very good, is if you have um, 
um, if you have an, inc uh, an inclination for um, a floor and you have a table uh, on top of that, um, the table will be such that it'll remain, uh, it'll remain flat. And so the question is why, why does it remain flat? It could have been, we could have felt this term, uh, we could have felt the inclination. So there is something, a mechanism, which is actually making sure that you don't feel this term. And so in this case, uh, this is called the axiom. And the axiom, uh, the axiom basically is uh, written as uh, an axiom field is giving, is related to the term theta by the axiom field divided by a scale at which you have this um, breaking uh, of symmetry, uh, the pesci queen symmetry. And so you have um, the scale at which it happens is FA. And you can see that now you have, you can write a field um, like basically the exponential, it's a complex field, the exponential of IAX, the field, uh, the, the axiom field, divided by this um, scale. So you have basically a phase exponential I theta. Um, and that's what gives you basically the mechanism for axioms. So it's a weird concept because it's basically saying, well, there is a symmetry, you don't feel it, and um, you may not feel it because there is a mechanism to, uh, in a sense, compensate for, for its existence. But um, if that's true, then this means that you should observe that it should be a field, an action field in this case, uh, feeling the universe because um, obviously QCD is everywhere. So there are several scenarios to uh, break uh, the basic queen symmetry. Um, you can break it uh, before inflation or after inflation. So I'm um, just showing one case where it's uh, basically before. And um, so you start with uh, massless action and then eventually you have the uh, inflation. So you stretch every, um, um, every wavelength and then eventually you have QCD, uh, QCD phase transition you have a tilt in your potential and then the action gets its mass. And, um, and from there, basically, you have to live with an action field. Now, the good thing about having an action in this case is that eventually, the, so the particle mass would be extremely small. I will come back in a second on this. But the, and you may say, oh, this is not a good dark matter candidate then. But what counts is not the fact that um, there is a particle mass associated with this field, what counts is that actually the field of in coherence like uh, interactions. And so it's really the notion of field relevant particles. So you can understand the notion of, I mean, you can speak about particle, but for dark matter, the effect on the universe comes from the coherent effect. So it has to be about a field relevant particle. So this is really different from everything I showed you before. And that field basically uh, has damped oscillation. And so it's not like uh, the normal scenario. Um, I will explain again tomorrow why th there are differences, but um, you have to keep in mind that not only is different because it's a field of a particle, but on top of that, the cosmology is, is a little bit different. That said, you can compute a relic density and like everything else, it needs to be uh, in the same order as what is observed. And so the relic density is um, more or less on the right ballpark, 0.1. Uh, but then it depends on the on the, the scale FA, uh, and it's normalized here to 10 to the 12 GeV. So you can see that if you change this value, then you don't get the right quality density, and then it's multiplied by the initial tilt I mentioned. So in principle, to get 0.1, you immediately get that you can see what you need. Now, why did I tell you it's a good dark matter candidate, but actually um, the cosmology is different? Um, is for the following. So first of all, we, um, you, can, you can solve this equation um, to, to see how it behaves in the universe. So it's just an oscillation equation, but it's actually damped. And the only thing I want to show you here, because I will need it tomorrow, is that um, initially you, so you have your axiom field evolving with time, but initially you see that the axiom field is starting to, uh, to oscillate. And when it starts to oscillate, um, it doesn't disappear, but it's actually uh, it's actually introducing some patterns which eventually you should be able to, to see. So um, this is the way you produce action, but this is a mechanism which in principle you can trace because it, it changes things um, in the universe. And I, I, show, I, I don't have enough, um, I mean, I need, I need to present other things tomorrow in order to explain why I think it's important. 
if you want more details, um, Karen really has uh, plenty of slides and they're extremely good. So um, here you have a reference and um, I think you can, you can learn a lot from it. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention is self-interacting dark matter. So um, I mentioned, well, we mentioned a little bit before that uh, self-interacting dark matter can explain the bullet cluster. So I can just show you if you have, uh, if you remember, there was um, this cluster, which is a merger, and we can see that uh, the ordinary matter essentially stays in the center while the dark matter has gone through, but you can set a limit um, on the dark matter interaction. And you can see that the dark matter interaction is around 10 to, I mean, it's basically around the, the Thompson cross-section, but it basically tells you that uh, it doesn't interact the same way as it interacts with variums. That said, it may interact with itself and you can compute the cross-section. So um, the first evidence, well, not evidence, but um, um, the first people to propose that there was an evidence for self-interacting dark matter was actually uh, Sperger and Steinhardt. Um, and what they were saying at the time is that there, there is a number of um, anomalies, which, uh, so this paper was actually in 2000, those anomaly 20 years later are still present. Um, one is a number of a small number of satellites, and the, the other problem, which is called the core cast problem, is the density inside objects. And they were saying that maybe if you have some some dark matter which is interacting, then you self-interacting, then you can actually um, solve the problem instead of having um, a large density in the galactic center, for example whatever object you look, instead of having very large dark matter density, you may actually reduce it by invoking those uh, self-interactions. Now, a lot of people have looked at it and it comes and goes, it's um, fashionable and sometimes people just um, um, forget it and then it comes back. So the bottom line is that when I show you that in the 2000, we were also thinking about light dark matter and light mediator, and people realize, well, actually, if you have a light mediator, for example, then um, it could act like a photon. And so, but it's it's a photon prime, it's not a normal photon. So it could be actually a particle, which is a mediator of a dark forces, of a dark matter forces. And so in this case, you can think about a dark coulomb, if you want. And so you're back to thinking the dark matter is more or less behaving like the solar model, except that it's not necessarily the same strength of interaction, not necessarily the same mass as we used to and so on. And so this was one of the paper which I think was really um, instrumental in, in looking at um, um, self-interacting dark matter from the point of view of particle physics. Uh, you can see the UK potential and so on. So that's why I'm saying the idea is more like a dark uh, cool in this case. Um, you have two types of uh, mediator. Uh, yesterday I mentioned the dark photon or dark Z prime, you can also have a dark scalar because um, especially after discovering the Higgs, you can think maybe you have a Higgs prime. Shiva, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so I had this question regarding the self-interacting dark matter uh, that uh, since this, this kind of dark matter can actually uh, answer the problem of uh, small scale structure formation. And yeah. uh, so what can be the off-putting things about this kind of a scenario? Uh, what can be that, that would disregard this, this kind of thing? I don't think you can. You can just put limits on it. Um, so one thing I should say, and again, it will become much clearer tomorrow. Um, one thing I should say is that you can call self-interacting dark matter anything which is self-interacting. But if you start to speak about strongly self-interacting, then you have you define a scenario and you have a certain cross-section. If you don't observe that, then you can say, okay, we are already out. But nothing prevents you to consider a weakly, weaky, sorry, weaker uh, self-interactions. So that's why I'm saying I don't think you can really exclude it. You can just put a limit on the interaction cross-section. Does it what, 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 what kind of uh, mass gain would this kind of a uh, uh, scenario give? Is, is there a limit to that? No, I don't think so. Well, the limit is always, as I said, at some stage you enter the range of um, you enter the range of uh, axioms and so on, so more field. But um, 
I think PV is, is perfectly valid. Um, I must say I'm not, I didn't follow the literature with great detail, so um, I'm not sure how low people go, but um, you know, in a sense you can do whatever because it's just a dark matter interaction with itself. So there is no constraint. You don't need to annihilate into something which has a mass, which, you know, which would set um, a limit. So as long as you have, um, you have a cross section, which is not, um, I mean, as long as your cross section doesn't exceed a Thomson cross section, which uh, you don't see the Thomson cross section here, but you see something almost like this, 210 to minus 24 centimeters square is a same ballpark. As long as you have a cross section which doesn't exceed that, and, um, um, you know, and you have a mediator which is not excluded by experiments, then, then that's fine. So it's a question of playing with the, um, with the couplings and playing with the mass, and, and that's it more or less. Yeah, thank you, thank you. That answers my question. All right, uh, next question is by Tong. Yeah. Uh, hello, Professor. Uh, so uh, I have a question about the, uh, the, the oscillation, the damping oscillation of the axiom that you show. So, yeah. Um, the, the, can you go, go back to the slide or the, or the curves? The curve my, the... my computer is always a bit capricious. <laughs> so uh, when I say at first axiom, uh, this uh, the axiom field is dropped down to the minimum value. So it's, can it be because uh, that uh, at first is the 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 the, ice, the the Hubble constant is so much larger than the equation we can neglect the, the final term and then uh, we have the that right yeah exactly you can take the different limits uh, and when you solve it you see that indeed it's uh, two different regions so as soon uh, so it's basically the equivalent of um, uh, in a sense it's equivalent of a decoupling so you have to be in the horizon i didn't explain what was the horizon but you need basically you have wavelength so it's hard to explain again without any support, but um, you have um, you have some wavelengths, and those wavelengths, uh, if if they have a physical um, implication, they need to be in the horizon. If they exceed the horizon, they don't have any physical implication. So you have to be inside the horizon, and this is that moment basically. So you have this transition from basically being um, the same order of the, the horizon to of the other right, if you want. Uh, to being inside the, uh, the horizon, being uh, exceeding the horizon. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, and um, my second question, yeah. Um, my second question that uh, uh, from the theta term in 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 the uh, in the strong CB sector, so uh, um, it can come. It's a solution that we have the axial field, a scalar axial field. But if, for example, like my my sir. Uh, he has uh, the idea that come from the vector dark matter. Uh, so there may, may be uh, many possibility to show this the strong CB problem right? beside axiom. Sorry, uh, I'm a bit lost. Where, where were you? Yeah, or... uh, so the theta term, uh, uh, so Pessy uh, Queen uh, uh, assume that it may come from a scalar term, uh, the scalar field axiom, but uh, like, um, uh, so my supervisor have a new idea, like uh, they have, uh, they can come from a vector dark matter. Um, yeah, sorry, because the connection was a little bit bad and uh, like it's yeah. getting. Yes, I mean, you could, um, you could couple them. Uh, so axioms eventually, and I, I did, I'm not going to speak about this, but in, indeed the way uh, to find them um, is basically that uh, they interact with the magnetic field and they would produce a photon. And I guess you can revert the, you know, you can revert the problem. You can say, well, they would be created by photons. Now, in practice, you can't really do that um, because you don't have enough energy. But if uh, the photon is basically mixed with a vector, uh, sorry, with another photon, like a photon prime, then you have the photon prime would have a mass, and then you can create the axiom. I think that's what you're referring to. Mm, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, next question is by Prisco. 
Um, yeah. Um, so about the uh, self-interactive matter, you said it helps with reducing the density in the core of yeah. uh, galaxy. Is this the core cups problem? Basically. Yes, oh, okay. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thanks, George. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Hello. Uh, so. Uh, so I have a question regarding the uh, pitch equivalent symmetry breaking scale. So, so like, is there is a lower bound on the uh, like symmetry breaking scale? I mean, yeah. So it, um, I should have put another plot there, but uh, uh, you have to, if you if you want the axion to be the dark matter, which you don't necessarily have. I mean, it doesn't have to be, but if you say that it's a dark matter candidate. Then uh, the formula that I wrote uh, there, it's basically telling you, you have to play with a different, I mean, you have theta i, so the, the tilt and fa, but they basically tell you what is the order of magnitude for this breaking. But you can see that uh, fa is really uh, high. So you're not going to probe it. I mean, it's not easy to probe. Okay, so like if the axion is not a dark matter, so like then the symmetry breaking scale can be much lower or? Yeah, then you can do whatever you want. I mean, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. But not whatever you want because yeah, there are experiments looking for them, but <laughs> and they've yeah. been but, um, but in principle, you can. I mean, if if you don't want the dark matter, if you want, don't want the action to be the dark matter, then in principle, it can live anywhere. It's just that then you have to look for it with experimental device, and and then the limits come from the experiments, not from the theory reasons. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, right. I showed a plot here. Yeah, um, I think I showed a plot where it was, but I should probably, I will try to add another one uh, to show you where the action lies with the different constraints. There are plenty of constraints. And again, Kieran is one who is actually maintaining the plots with the constraints on action. So it would be good, I think, if I add one tomorrow. All right. So I want to now uh, so this is now a lecture for really, um, and I wanted to speak about uh, the the signature of dark matter, the astro and cosmic signature. Um, and I think I'm a bit late, so I think uh, probably I will have to finish tomorrow the, the, the lecture four, um, but it's okay because I can shorten um, the section five, and then I will um, show all the things that I promised to show today and, and the nuclear synthesis. So the first thing is how do you detect dark matter? So if it's an axiom, as we say, well, um, it's a little bit more difficult, but um, there is a way which is the production of photon. If it's a particle, then, and if it decay or annihilate, then it will produce something else. And in principle, you can see it is something else. And that's the way you can uh, trace back to dark matter. So this technique of seeing the product through, I mean, seeing the product that dark matter produce is called the indirect detection technique. Now, it's mostly, um, we use it basically, uh, mostly for looking into space. So, so let me do the argument and then I can uh, answer the question maybe. So I show you a spiral galaxy and I show you um, a, the rotation curves um, for a spiral galaxy yesterday. Um, there was a question actually I will answer also on um, elliptical galaxies. But, uh, so you have a rotation curves, and as we said yesterday, most of them are fairly flat and clearly have uh, showed that um, the visible galaxy is embedded into a much bigger structure, which is a dark matter halo. Um, and now what is very important here is that because it's a dark matter halo in principle, if it's made of particles which either decay or annihilate, then you should see those products. So say that the dark matter annihilates into electrons, then you should see electrons in the dark matter halo in principle. So how do you do that? Well, as I say, in principle, you have, so if you assume that the dark matter annihilates and it annihilates into standard model particles, then you should have dark matter, sorry, you should have standard model particles a bit everywhere uh, in, in the galactic halo. So the way you, you want to do is basically look at different directions. Uh, and see if you can uh, see traces of, for example, the electron or other stellar model particles um, in further away from the galactic disk. Now, 
you have to be careful because obviously there will be more particles produced where the density of dark matter is the highest. So you need to make sure that you know the dark matter density and then um, that tells you basically where the, dark, where the annihilation product would be or where the decay product would be. Uh, in previous lecture, I told you that dark matter had to be stable. That doesn't mean that it never, it never decays. It just tells you that the lifetime is very, very long. So you will not, if it decays, it will be a very slow decay. So you, you cannot expect many particles to be produced, but still there will be some. So um, then the question is which instrument you're going to use. And depending on which kind of product you want to see, then you're going to use different techniques. So I'm going to first show you if I manage, uh, the history of it. And then I will show you what kind of products uh, people have looked and then uh, show you how we can detect them. So the first, um, the first people, um, sorry, this is here is more important. Um, the, the first people who, who started to think about uh, detecting dark matter this way, so indirectly, uh, there's a number of people, Bushtaker was one, there is Joe Silk and a number of other people. But you can see the immediate reaction was to say, well, you could trace dark matter in principle with gamma rays. Now, I told you dark matter has to be neutral. So then you may say, but how can it actually produce gamma rays if it's neutral? And that's because it will annihilate into something else uh, or um, it will be coupled to charged particles and eventually those particles will produce some, gamma, some, some photons. So uh, you see here an important paper, this, this was in 1978. And this was really the, the first paper, I believe, which was starting to say, we can detect dark matter by the annihilation product. And the annihilation product can produce a continuum of gamma ray and a continuum is important um, because it tells you that you would have gamma rays at uh, loss of energy. But the other thing is it also can produce a mono energy decline because the dark matter can produce via a loop diagram, for example, two photons and these photons will trace um, the dark matter mass. So anyway, so here it's about dark matter annihilation and this annihilation eventually producing a substantial amount of photons. So here are the diagrams which uh, I was mentioning just before. Uh, you can have a direct production of photons via um, some, some charge loops, for example. And then the photon have one energy. Which, so you start with two dark matter particles and that produce, um, they will be non-relativistic um, non in the dark matter halo. So they produce two photons with an energy which is basically equal to the dark matter mass. So this is uh, a bit of a holy grail because if you observe this photon with, I mean, at, uh, at a, if you see the lines and you don't think those lines are related to some astrophysical sources, then you have a measurement of a dark matter mass straight away. So it's extremely important because if you can identify that those lines are actually emitted by the dark matter, then you have a measurement of a dark matter mass. So it's the best you can achieve. But as I said, you can also have a continuum of photon. And one way to produce it would be actually that um, you have annihilation into fermions or antifermions, for example, into charged particles. And then they would emit some photons. And those photons, um, well, eventually you can detect them, but you know that their energy would be always smaller than the dark matter mass. So if you see photons which you don't think are emitted by an astrophysical source, that's great because you can say, well, it's probably dark matter origin, but it doesn't really help you pinpoint the dark matter mass. So it's extremely valid, but not as powerful as seeing a line emission. Um, otherwise, you can have Bremsstrahlung emission. If you produce, for example, those uh, fermions, you can have synchrotron emission. Synchrotron radiation is very important because it gives you um, um, an emission basically in radio. So you started with particles of very high energy perhaps, but the signature would be actually at very low energy, would be in radio. So in terms of photons, you can, the dark matter can produce basically anything except uh, photons which are in the visible range. Because if it does that, we would have seen it already and we wouldn't be looking for it for the last 50 years. So in a sense, you're free. Uh, if you propose a dark matter model from the particle physics point of view, Anything is okay, as long as obviously you don't, do not exceed um, the experimental bounds. 
but also as long as you're not white in a visible uh, regime. So gamma rays and X-rays is a logical uh, signature because usually the dark matter is heavy, as I told you, with the Lee-Weinberg argument, people thought dark matter has to be heavier than a photon. In reality, it can be, it can be lighter than that, so it could emit something like X-rays. But also, if it produces electrons and positrons, we know it's going to produce eventually, or there would be associated signature in microwave and radio. All right, so um, people have looked for, um, for those photons. Uh, as I showed you in the paper, the first paper was 78. Um, but uh, in 1984, there was another important paper which was published by Silk and Srenicki. Um, which was saying, well, actually, also it's a way to produce antimatter. And in this case, they were focusing on uh, antiprotons, but in reality, you can think about uh, positrons and so on. So uh, this was a very instrumental tool because if you found, for whatever reason, if you detect some uh, antimatter in our galaxy, and if you think that uh, the amount of antimatter you detected is far greater than uh, what you expect, then potentially you have traced back. Uh, you have found the dark matter. Now, what is really interesting is that if you remember, I think the first lecture, I was mentioning there is an asymmetry between the number density of particles and antiparticles. There's almost no antiparticles left. Well, in the galaxy, it's not that true because uh, you have astrophysical sources which recreate this uh, antimatter. But um, it doesn't recreate it in equal number. And so you have less, you still have less matter than you have on, of antimatter. So if you found, and you can make the prediction more or less, so if you found much more antimatter than you expected, you probably have a good um, indication that there is some dark matter. All I right. Say, do you think it's a good moment to take a five minute break? No? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, resume in five minutes. Thanks. Okay.
All right. If you wish, we can continue. Okay. I've uh, seen some question in the chat. Um, yeah. Missed that one. Okay, um, human collect. Well, I, can, I guess I can collect them at the end of the lecture, and I. There were no more than this one, I think. Um, yeah, I think there's a, a few, but it's okay. I will. I will write them and. Um, oh, okay, sure, sure, sure. Please, sorry. thanks. Okay, um, sorry. In the Q&A, no, maybe? Uh, yeah, or I can, yeah, or, or after. Okay. Uh, There's a, a raised hand by Alessandro. So please go ahead, Alessandro. Uh, hi. Uh, well, uh, I have a question uh, about uh, uh, one thing uh, uh, we have said before. Uh, well, we have said uh, uh, that uh, um, the probe of the existence of uh, dark matter uh, is the fact that uh, we, we can detect uh, a gamma ray or radio background. Uh, but uh, how we can distinguish uh, uh, this uh, event from uh, other cosmological event uh, uh, events like, like uh, gamma ray burst uh, or uh, other type? Yeah, exactly. yeah it's a good question. It's very hard. And um, this is why actually often um, but often people say oh, we discovered dark matter and it, it happens that it's not the case because precisely it's super hard to distinguish whether it's dark matter or a physical source. So, um, I, will, I will mention it after, I will show you the examples where it's not clear. The only thing one can do is model as much as possible uh, what you expect from an astro astrophysical source and then see if there is a deviation to that. But again, uh, and I will later, in some cases, you don't know. It, it could well be that it's uh, an astrophysical source, and you there is one or two issues where there are still questions. Okay, thank you. Okay. Maybe you need to switch off your sound. Okay, yeah, I, I moved it here. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so now we, sorry, I showed you wrong slide. Oh, sorry, um, no, I'm too late. So I was, um, I was going to show you the theoretical prediction, and then I will show you the experiments, and then I will show you um, the results and where indeed uh, Alessandro is right. It's very hard to detect uh, whether it's dark matter or uh, an astrophysical source. So as I said, we need to look in some directions. Uh, and we know that the annihilation would be everywhere in yellow, but it depends on the, on the dark matter uh, density. And so now you've seen the Boltzmann equation. Uh, and the Boltzmann equation is the one we're going to use except that now we're not in an expanding universe because we're looking at the galaxy. So for, um, for the, um, sorry, the expanding universe, we had minus three HN, which represents the expansion of the universe. Now we can uh, let this uh, term away. We don't need to take, in, take it into account. And then we had sigma V N square, if it's an annihilation, uh, if it's a particle which annihilate, and we had minus n zero, but minus n zero uh, was only relevant when we were doing a thermal dark matter candidate in the early universe. And now we're not doing that anymore. So we can also uh, uh, give this term away. So we're left with a very simple equation, which is the number density of dark matter particles evolve with time as a depletion. It's minus the annihilation cross section times the number density of dark matter squared. Now, every time the dark matter annihilates, eventually it will produce some photons. It may produce one, may produce many. So in reality, here I'm, I'm uh, making a shortcut and I wrote that the number of photons is basically equal to the number of dark matter particles, um, the number density uh, as it evolves. That's not exactly true, but for now we're going to assume that every time the dark matter annihilates and produce a pair of electron positrons, the minimum is there will be at least one photon. So in this case, you have a simple relationship. You say, okay, the number of density of photons, um, the evolution of that number density 
is simply given by the annihilation cross-section times the number density square. So this is your prediction for the evolution of number of photons uh, in yellow, that's it. But now um, you have a DNDT, and so you probably don't know what to do with it. And you just have to remember that a DT is proportional to a length, and that is basically the line of sight. So you look into, into specific direction, and that gives you basically the number of photons in that direction. So all you need to do is an integral over the direction. So you, you do DL, um, so the line of sight, the, the integral over the line of sight of your um, DN gamma DT. And that is basically, in principle, the flux of gamma that you expect in that direction. Now, you just use the equation that you obtain with sigma v and the n square, and that gives you basically the number of the flux of photons in that direction. That is extremely simple. Ish sorry, oops. Issue, uh, issue is that actually you don't know the number density of dark matter straight away, but you do actually have access to uh, a quantity, which is the energy density. So you don't know the number density because actually you don't know the dark matter mass. If you knew the dark matter mass, you would access it, but you don't. So the only thing you can say is you can determine the density of dark matter in one direction, and therefore we can integrate this over the line of sight, and that gives you the flux of photon in that direction. So that is the formula at the bottom uh, of the slide. Now, uh, the term which is uh, in the blue box, which is the integral of the line of sight of the density square, is called the J factor. And in fact, Pierre Olio, uh, 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 was one of the um, first to compute those factors. Um, if you have the same integral, but you actually had the, so the integral of the line of sight of only the dark matter density, power one, not two, so you have a decay, for example, then in this case, it's called the D factor, like decay. But like this, as I wrote it, it's a J factor. And you can see that uh, this has nothing to do with dark matter particles per se. It's just a density of dark matter in a specific direction. So you can do this for any kind of model. And then you multiply by the properties of dark matter, which is the annihilation cross-section divided by the dark matter mass square. So this flux. Um, obviously will depend now on the particle that you assume for the dark matter. If it annihilates a lot, then you would have a huge flux. If it's very light, you would have a very large flux. If it's really heavy, the flux would be uh, minimal if a cross-section is, for example, relatively weak. So it all depends on the candidate you're going to choose, but the flux can be easily computed once you specify a model, and the J-factor can be computed whatever model you're thinking of if you assume a particle and not a field. Okay, so yesterday I showed you uh, the spiral galaxy, the rotation curves for a spiral galaxy, and um, I told you they're more or less all, all the same, more or less all flat. So you have a velocity, uh, you have uh, the velocity is related to uh, a mass per volume, and that is basically related to an energy density. So you can just access uh, you can see now it's not very hard. You take the derivative of this, and that gives you basically um, a density profile. So uh, the energy density for the dark matter, so the density profile. So um, here is um, the result, basically, of this exercise, which is taking the derivative of a mass and, and using the velocity. And you obtain uh, the plot, which is on the right, which is the, the density profile of dark matter in a spiral, in this case, in the middle, supposedly in the Milky Way, but that works more, more or less any spiral galaxy, which is fairly big. Um, now, the point which is interesting is that you can see that, so you, you on the plot on the right, you see many, uh, many profiles possible. So you have many lines, blue, green, uh, etc. So if you can't distinguish your color, let me just say what is important is you have many possibilities which are displayed on this plot. But they're all the same, um, above 10 kiloparsec, they all converge, they all agree. Be below 10 kiloparsec, they actually disagree. So some models predict that the, the dark matter density is actually very uh, caspy, goes, um, is basically diverging. And other models predict that it's actually uh, is forming a core, if you want, it's fairly flat. And for a long time, people didn't know, even for our Milky Way, where we are. 
And there is always a question of whether this is true, um, is, which kind of profile do we have depending on the size of the object? So dwarf galaxies, smaller galaxies seem to have um, a density profile which is more flat than for our galaxy. Cluster of galaxies, not necessarily clear, uh, is maybe, um, maybe more compatible with um, a cusp. So this is really the question of which kind of density we have. Now you may say, but why is it so uncertain? So just so to put things in context, this is the dark matter density in our galaxy, for example. Now it's related, it's really the translation of a velocity, uh, of the rotation velocity, which is on the left. We know that um, the dark matter halo, the dark matter mass um, becomes more prominent at very large distance from the galactic center to compensate the fact that there is dissipation, there is this halo, which is slowing down basically everything. Um, or not slowing down, but maintaining cohesion, if you want, uh, at very large distance. But very close to the center, this is really the domain of the baryons. The dark matter, I mean, you can see that the mass uh, per volume for the dark matter is not actually very, um, uh, is not uh, prominent and you mostly, the velocity is mostly dominated by the, the baryonic matter. And so you can see that because the, um, the velocity for the halo is going to zero, uh, you have a lot of certainty how exactly it's going to zero. And that's why you see, uh, and obviously if it's our galaxy, it's even harder to measure because it's dominated by the baryons which are very bright. So you have a lot of uncertainty on that uh, specific um, curve for the, for the rotation velocity. And as a result, you can't really determine with a lot of precision the density of dark matter in the core of our galaxy. But it's true actually for other galaxies, there's always, um, I mean, it's always a, a very difficult exercise. Um, for many galaxies now, we know that nonetheless, and for cluster two, we know that it seems like the profile tends to diverge and it tends to be like one over R at small distance. So the closer the center you are, the, it seems like most of galaxies and bigger galaxies and clusters of galaxies seem to behave like the density is proportional to one over R. Uh, but for small galaxies, like dwarf galaxies, it's not really clear yet. And they actually seem to be more uh, uh, constant, so they seem to be more quarry. All right, so now that you have this in mind, um, I just wanted to go back to this question yesterday, uh, a few days ago on the uh, elliptical galaxy, because I thought it, it was very interesting, in fact. The question, I show you a rotation velocity, and that's really easy to define, to look at stars, for example, in an object which is, uh, which is rotating. But when it's an elliptical, then uh, you don't really have a perfect um, trajectory. So it would be more elliptical uh, trajectory, but you can still define the velocity. And those objects are much harder to, I mean, basically it's much harder to determine their velocity. So um, for a long time, a lot of people were saying, well, actually you don't need so much dark matter in those objects. And often when there is, you know, there are claims that there is no dark matter in a galaxy, it's often related to elliptical galaxies. But nonetheless, um, and that is, that is one paper, uh, I'm not sure how much uh, consensus it has, but it's, it's one paper which is very interesting because it looks at one elliptical galaxy, which is fairly big. And you can see the rotation curve for that uh, elliptical galaxy, uh, which is on the left. Um, and you can see now the total, which is fairly flat. Uh, and then you can see the stars, which is decreasing because there is dissipation. And you can see the dark matter going up, like for, uh, for a spiral galaxy. And then there's a contribution for a black hole. So it's more or less in this case, like a spiral galaxy. They're not all like that. Um, and, but usually, it seems like most of them contain dark matter. It's more, as I said last time, it's an exception when it doesn't. And that is related, I mean, the way people prove it usually is more using X-rays and other techniques, but more or less all of them, even if they're not perfect, perfectly flat, they also have a velocity which you can eventually determine, which gives you access eventually to uh, the profile. I, show, I wanted to show you, but I think um, I might not spend too much time, but the thing I wanted to show you is that there are uncertainties on those plots. And the fact that there are uncertainty on, on this plot means that when you try to determine the, um, 
the density of dark matter in these objects, it is uncertain. So you can say, well, the profile, you know, is, I'm oh, sorry, I should have said it's a Navarro French white, like it's written at the bottom. Um, but you can't really say how, how well it is. And then there are the uh, parameters, gamma, alpha, beta, which you can determine, but uh, it doesn't mean that uh, you have perfect determination on those parameters. And usually you have gamma equal one, as I say, for our galaxy. It doesn't mean for, for the others, it's exactly the same. So it doesn't mean that the dark matter halo profile is universal. Carlos Frank, usually, who is one of the authors, usually says they, they have to be, but um, I guess we don't know yet. Um, I think it's a fair statement. I'm not an expert, obviously, but um, uh, I think uh, there is no consensus yet on, on the form in all those uh, objects. All right, uh, just it's a parenthesis, I'm not going to mention it, but if you want, so I show you the flux of photons. I, I, I just added a formula, which is the same, but I just added the fact that the dark matter can annihilate into cosmic ray. So it's a slight modification of the formula I show you. But the main thing is you can do this uh, line of sight integration analytically. I would encourage you if you like uh, doing maths, um, it's a very nice uh, calculation. And there is something quite magical which, uh, which happened, which is that you see that you have a divergence in the, um, in the, the core of that uh, profile. So at very small distance, the profile diverge. So when you do the integral, in principle, it diverges. So in principle, it's not physical. It should stop at some stage. And it may stop if dark matter annihilates. It may stop because dark matter is disappearing. But in principle, if dark matter does annihilate, um, it could go up forever, and that is not physical. Now, the point is, when you do this integral, you also have to integrate over your angular resolution. And you never have an experiment which is perfect. So you never see quite the center. So you will never see the divergence. And so in reality, even though you have a divergence, or it looks like you have a divergence, your uh, flux would be finite. It would be larger toward the center, but it would be finite because it would be cut by the fact that your instrument uh, you know, telescope or whatever, have a certain angular resolution and would not be able to see perfectly the, uh, what happened in at r equals zero, basically. All right, so um, I show you how, I show you that we expected annihilation or decay potentially into standard model particles, and in this case, that gives us a signature. Um, I mentioned photons, and I would like to just say, well, what, about, what happened if we forget about the photons and we're just focusing on the standard model fermions which have been produced. And that's essentially the cosmic ray. So if a dark matter annihilates or decay into standard model fermions, then they will, um, they will be in the halo, they will propagate, uh, and eventually um, some electrons, for example, will meet some uh, positrons, and then eventually annihilate, and you can produce all sorts of things. Uh, for example, it can be all the QCD processes, and so eventually you will form what you form in an accelerator. You, you can form uh, uh, cairns, mesons, and all sorts of things. So it's very important uh, if you really want to determine, uh, to prove that you have de uh, detected dark matter. For example, if you have uh, uh, a flux of gamma ray, which you think is related to dark matter, then you should also see somehow the cosmic ray. So you need to make, um, and we call it multi-messenger, you need to make predictions which take into account all the possible particles which you produce and which could be observed. Um, now, the point is, um, the cosmic ray, when you produce them, they don't stay like this in the yellow. They actually propagate, they diffuse, in fact. So you have an equation of diffusion, which is very complicated because in, uh, for example, for the Milky Way, you have a magnetic field, um, you have wind, you have also, you have convection, you have all sorts of things. And so in principle, you have to describe when the cosmic ray have been basically produced by the dark matter, you have to explain how they move through the galaxy and eventually uh, can be detected on Earth. So you have, um, this is just an example uh, for, the, um, for the diffusion equation, but this equation has to be solved. And eventually you get a spectrum out of it, which I just wanted to show you here. What, it doesn't, I mean, I'm showing you an example at different values for the dark matter mass, 10 GV, 100 GV, 1000 GV, so TV, 10 TV. Um, the only 
the reason why I'm showing you this is that you will notice that usually for, it's not true for all, but for many of um, the channel, you see that the prediction dark matter is producing photons in the shape of, um, um, of a bell, basically you, you just see this parabolic, um, exp I mean, parabolic flux. Why is it important? Because, well, anything else produces the same, any astrophysical source produces exactly the same signature, and in particular, uh, millisecond pulsars. In millisecond pulsars can emit, for example, electron, they produce gamma rays, and they produce gamma rays more or less like uh, what you see here in this, uh, in this figure. So the previous question from Alessandro, I think, was how do, do we distinguish um, we, we can't. I mean, the best thing you can do is just try to correlate many signatures, try to identify whether an astrophysical signature gives you, you know, the right signature in whatever, electron, neurons, and so on. And if there is some anomaly, then you can say that it's likely there is something else. But you need to know your background. So it's like exactly if you're working at the LHC, you, know, you need to know the background. Here is the same problem. You need to know your background extremely well. The only difference with LHC is you can't redo the experiment. You don't control any of the parameters. And so it's, uh, in a sense, it's much more complicated. Same thing, you can see it's always the same parabolic shape. Now, the red, I mentioned radio before, so I just wanted to show you some, um, some limits. But if the dark matter is too light, and I told you before, yesterday I told you I like light dark matter personally. Um, but if it's too light, uh, like for example, a GEV, you have to be careful because it can actually produce more radio emission than the central black hole. So you have to be careful um, when I say, well, you can assume certain cross-section and certain mass. Uh, you can, but obviously you have constraints. And in some cases, the constraints tells you, well, it's already excluded. Um, you can also, in principle, you could also have a microwave um, signature, so the dark matter can annihilate and produce electrons and positrons. And you will see that in the Planck experiment, literally, or WMAP. So you can see it, for example, um, Planck uh, is looking at the temperature of the universe, and for that, a different channel. Um, they have several frequencies. They have 33 gigahertz, which was the smallest frequency they were looking at. But they also have the highest, which is called uh, eight, which is 857 GHz. It's called HFI. And the dark matter can produce basically signature uh, in Planck, and we can look for it. And we have looked for them, and uh, we found that basically Planck didn't detect dark matter, so we can put a limit on it. So just a little parenthesis to tell you that there are many signatures, and um, and we can use those experiments. Um, the other thing I wanted to tell you is, I told you the dark matter can produce cosmic ray, well, fine, but then those cosmic ray eventually can arrive to us, pass through the atmosphere, interact with protons in the atmosphere, and eventually you will see a shower which uh, arrives uh, on the ground. So um, what is interesting then is that if it's true, then you think, well, I can basically have a, a number of uh, uh, experiments to look for either the gamma rays or the, the cosmic rays. Uh, on from the ground. And so you have here important experiments. Uh, S was looking for gamma rays as magic and veritas, but CTA is looking really for cosmic ray and for the, the showers. Um, and you have another one looking at uh, high energy uh, cosmic ray, which is basically uh, Hawk, the Hawk experiment, uh, which is um, uh, um, in Mexico. and. You have a number of experiments basically looking at very high energy cosmic rays. So in principle, we're covering um, um, basically all the interesting range if dark matter is heavy. And in fact, we're not doing that only from the ground. We're also looking at cosmic ray, which are, so I told you in the yellow, there should be um, a dark matter annihilates and should produce a cosmic ray. Then in principle, if you send, a, if you have basically a telescope in space uh, or a satellite, then um, you should be able to, um, uh, to see them. So one of them is AMS02, which you see here, um, and the logo is on the left. Uh, it's on the ISS, so it's basically installed there on the ISS. And this experiment try to see uh, antimatter mostly. So if they try to measure um, positrons, but also antiprotons, uh, which um, has been pos possibly produced by the dark matter. 
Um, when you're in space, you can also look, so you can have a satellite look and searching uh, for gamma rays. And so that's the case, for example, of a Fermi uh, satellite. Um, and light is basically the experiment on Fermi. And this is one of the map uh, that they've done. So they basically map the, um, the galaxy in gamma rays. And um, they found a number of uh, sources, like I said, the millisecond pulsars, um, and they found other objects. And then the question is, when you have those precise map, uh, is, the question is, is there any anomalies or not? So let me just go now to the results. Um, so first of all, one, one important thing is you can look in the Milky Way and you can look in objects where you think there is not so much ordinary matter and more dark matter. And the reason why you do you want to do that is that in this case, you don't expect so many, if you don't have so much ordinary matter, then you shouldn't have too many gamma rays from ordinary matter. So if you see gamma rays from those objects, which are mostly dominated by dark matter, then it is, it is a signature of dark matter. So the primary target, because in principle, it's a clean signature, you don't expect gamma rays from those objects because there, is, there are not so many stars, there's not so much uh, bionic matter in it. So if you found gamma rays there, it's a very good indication that um, the dark matter is perhaps annihilating or decaying. So there are uh, several experiments looking at them, but it was quite astonishing. So first of all, you have to find those objects, which is not an easy thing. Uh, the experiment does found several. Um, and um, well, I guess everyone has their preferred, <laughs> preferred uh, satellite. Um, you see the small Magellanic cloud and the large Magellanic cloud. Those ones are big in the end, and they contain a lot of ordinary matter, so they're not the objects you really want to look at, although people, people obviously study them. Mm -hmm. But you can see on this, there is uh, one of them is called Reticulum 2. Uh, this one is a, a primary target for dark matter searches, and there are a few which are looked at, but Reticulum 2 is very interesting because it really doesn't contain many, many stars and you don't really expect a lot of gamma rays. Here is the result. Um, so by looking at those targets, plus Fermi, which I just show you with a map of gamma rays and uh, stacking the result, basically, people are able to uh, constrain the dark matter and in particular, it's a probability, I mean, the probability that it annihilates. This is the result. You see the plot, which is sigma V versus the dark matter mass. You see lots of curves which correspond to the different objects, but if you combine them all, you obtain the thickest uh, black line, which is a line at the bottom. And that line, and sorry, and you can see uh, an horizontal line, which is dashed, which corresponds to the thermal relic density. So an annihilation cross section of about 310 to minus 26. And you can see that the dark line cut uh, through this uh, relic density line. And so in a sense, uh, this analysis is excluding, and this was in um, this was early on, but this uh, analysis is excluding uh, thermal dark matter if the dark matter has a mass up to, uh, in this case, 10 GeV, oh, sorry, 100 GeV. So very powerful tool because um, if, you, if you say, well, dark matter um, is thermal, it has, we know, uh, basically, as I show you, it could be MeV, um, but I, it has to be basically in, in a range where it has minimum of MeV up to um, maybe TeV. And already here, um, um, the, Fermi, uh, the Fermi results tell you, and you, you, you can extend them to a lower mass, but they can tell you already, uh, dark matter is not a thermal candidate between 1 and 100 GeV, forget it. So it's a, it was a very strong, I mean, very important milestone. I think somehow it's not been celebrated enough, but for me it was also a turn, an important turn in the community. I show you more plots, but just to show you that all of those um, results are essentially excluded thermal dark matter uh, if the dark matter is smaller, is lighter than uh, 100 GeV. So it's it's a very, I mean, indirect detection is a very powerful method and very important method to look for dark matter. Now we are hoping to do the same with our experiments, including HOPE, which I mentioned. Um, and then with CTA, I think that would be a, a game changer. Just to, uh, to finish off, because I think I don't have so much time, but uh, um, just to show you the confusion that you can have between uh, dark matter and astrophysical source. 
So Fermi provide this beautiful map. And the data could be analyzed uh, by other people, not just by the collaboration. So it happens that uh, Dan Hooper <clears throat> and Isa Good Enough actually looked at the data uh, and they realized, uh, so they're not part of the collaboration, they realized that actually looking at the data, there is an anomaly, which is around uh, from 1 to 10 GV. They realized that uh, this anomaly was basically fitting. I mean, you could have explained it with uh, a dark matter annihilating into uh, solar model particles. So excess of gamma ray in the range, in the GV range, and um, can be fitted by a dark matter in that range. So if you want to have a perfect uh, parabolic shape, you need something like, uh, you need a dark matter mass of 10 GV, let's say. So shows that potentially the, the dark matter can be light, I mean, relatively light still. But then I show you the constraints. They are hard to do now because we know that, in fact, um, by stacking with um, the dwarf galaxy, uh, it's really hard to make it survive. But then I always found a way to, I think, to make it survive. I think it's still thinking that could be uh, dark matter. However, a lot of people have said, well, could we explain this with a millisecond pulsar, for example? And when they've done, uh, I'm not showing you plots here, but um, you have to you don't know where they are. You have to distribute them in some ways and see if that could actually fit the excess. And the answer is uh, yes. I mean, there's been a lot of controversy. So yes, no, yes, no, depending on the offer. Uh, but I think there is quite good evidence that, it, I mean, it's very likely that this excess is due, in fact, to have a population of mini pulsar in the center of the galaxy. Uh, the other thing is what they observe um, other groups, but so one related to Dan Hooper was um, uh, some uh, what you call Fermi bubbles. So uh, Fermi, it happens that Fermi has some um, figure of eight, basically some bubbles in gamma rays. Now, funnily enough, you see those bubbles in X-rays, you see them in, in radio also, and I think you see them in, uh, in other frequency. So those translate some phenomena, but at first, uh, which may be also related to uh, perhaps the central black hole or something else, uh, another um, astrophysical source. But at the beginning, also people were saying, oh, maybe this is a dark matter. Again, I don't think that would be true, um, but there was a lot of controversy. And I think now people have admitted that it's more related to, um, to uh, astrophysical sources. Um, there are funny things sometimes. Um, I just wanted to show you now the spectrum of gamma ray for the Milky Way extend up to 100 TV. Um, and again, it's correlated with this uh, figure of eight at the beginning, I mean, at the center. Who knows what it is? Maybe dark matter, maybe something else. Um, then when we looked at other objects like um, an, um, an AGN, so Centaurus A, um, again, we see an excess. In this case, again, you see this uh, this curve. Um, it could be millisecond pulsar, could be dark matter, but works too. So we never know, and that's only because the mechanism by which you would observe a dark matter is the production of electron positrons, and so are uh, is the same mechanism for um, uh, millisecond pulsars. So the moment you have this, you can explain any anomaly if there is one. Uh, maybe more fun, uh, I wanted to show you something a bit surprising. Um, so I, I mentioned that uh, I liked, or well, I showed that you can you can, you can uh, uh, find a counter example to the Lee-Wenberg limit. And then in this case, you can propose MEV dark matter if you want. Um, and at the same time, when I was doing this work, uh, an experiment, um, so a satellite called uh, um, Integral, and an experiment on this satellite called SPI, uh, reported a new results from the number of positrons in, in the galactic center. And in fact, they actually mapped um, those positron distribution. Uh, you can see the, the map here. I should also add the reference to the, um, to the, paper, the experimental paper. But uh, what you can see here is that this map seems like center on the galactic center, fairly spherical. And so it tells you that um, potentially the positrons um, are well located in the galactic center, but also correlated to uh, the highest density of dark matter in the galactic center. What, what happens here is you don't see really the map of positrons. You see, um, you see basically the positrons annihilating with the electron. And when they do that, they form positronium. Uh, the positronium is either decaying into either two photons or three photons. The two photons 
is basically uh, a line again. So it's five, it traces the mass of the electron, so it's 5, 11 keV. All the three photons give you a continuum. And that continuum is um, basically is, uh, it's less than 5, 11 keV. But what they see, what they, I mean, the map I show you here is really the 5, 11 keV. And so you know that there is antimatter in the galactic center. More, more than that, you know that this antimatter is actually positron. And more than that, you know that for this positronium to happen, the positrons must be at very low energy. And so as I was proposing MEV dark matter, the natural, the natural thing to say is, well, it annihilates and produces positrons and AH, positrons and electrons. And there is almost no energy. So you can't produce this 511 keV line. And of course, if it's true, then uh, the positrons that you should see, so the, uh, the gamma rays you should see in that respect, should be correlated with the distribution of dark matter. And that was exactly the case. So this, this was in 2003, and this was um, you know, very surprising and very exciting because suddenly it's like, oh, maybe dark matter is like, and maybe we found it through this. But again, um, the question is, can it be uh, explained by um, astrophysical sources or not? Now, the funny thing about this one is uh, no one could prove anything. So we still, we still don't know the origin of this line. I personally now believe it's not dark matter, um, but I couldn't really exclude it completely. And um, it, it may actually, I mean, no one, no astrophysical sources that people really know um, explain the emission either. So very puzzling. The best um, explanation is actually nucleosynthesis um, from the stars within the center. Um, it's probably the likely explanation, but the, I don't think there is any consensus either on that. So very interesting problem. Um, so the thing I wanted to show you is that, uh, and this was exciting, but this is also very controversial. If you have dark matter um, in a galaxy, then uh, in principle, it should be accreted by a black hole. And then the question is, will it actually be the density? Is the density going to increase or not? Uh, so it's, it's not about the dark matter being absorbed by a black hole or anything like this. It's just the density, there is accretion of all the matter around, and the density of dark matter should increase eventually. And if it does that, and if the dark matter annihilates, then it, it will produce some gamma rays uh, and eventually produce radio emission. So what happened is that you have a black hole and you have a shadow of a black hole, uh, which you see, but there is a light, uh, last, um, um, last trajectory where basically you can see the light, so you can still see some light. And what happened is that this is basically enhanced now because of the presence, um, uh, because the dark matter may annihilate. So um, this is a funny, um, funny work actually. Um, but what is interesting is you can make prediction. And in fact, now we're improving uh, those prediction. And we're working with people from, uh, with, um, I mean, the EHT who, who make, who observe now the black hole. So our prediction was, um, was before the observation. Um, and we will see basically if, um, if they can put limits on the dark matter um, accretion or actually they can even observe it. So this would be very exciting. Now, I think um, I'm exceeding my time. So I guess I yes. can continue. Tomorrow. Um, and uh, tomorrow I'll do direct detection and a bit of LHE and then the cosmology wrapping up everything I say and answering questions. Oh. Sounds good. So maybe it's a good moment to stop the recording and now we switch to the Q&A.